I thank you for watching and I'm still a proud Canadian. You're going to hear me say uh, things like y'all and, and the way I sound, the way I talk. Um, I don't sound Canadian much anymore. I've been gone for a while, but still a proud Canadian. And this has been really cool to listen to. Um, I know like the quarantine has been really tough on people, but um, we've just been able to listen to so many great coaches talk and all these, um, all these clinics have been online. Uh, it's just been amazing. So, you know, it's really been a blessing. I've, I've learned so much, you know, I can't wait till all these things get posted and uh, we get to rewatch them, you know, cause I'm a, I'm a guy that takes notes and rewatches and uh, you know, just can't wait to wait to watch them again and learn some more. Um, but when Chris asked me to get on here, I was kind of thinking of a topic and, and there's so many guys that are good at the, the technical and the tactical and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I was thinking about, you know, what, what kind of value could I bring? And, um, you know, one topic that kind of came to my mind, um, you know, that I thought of that really you don't hear a lot of people talking about. Uh, it, it, it does have a culture aspect to it, so I will touch on culture, but I thought of inheriting a bad program. Um, you know, taking over a job that people say, yeah, that's a tough job, you can't win there, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, I think there's some, some misconceptions about it. You know, um, you know, I really wanted to kind of take a dive into like, what's the decision-making process like? What do you got to think about when, when you're faced with taking a job like that? Um, you know, kind of a, a self-assessment, you know, self-aware, you know, think some qualities that I think you have to have to be successful in a tough job, um, you know, and, and touch on some things that we've done here, um, you know, as far as w what you got to do to win um, with less, you know, if you're in a tough job and you've got less resources and, and things like that, some, you know, some things that you can do to win with less. So, you know, hopefully, you know, some of this brings some value, um, you know, hopefully there's somebody out there that's, you know, kind of weighing an option. Should I take this job? Is, is it a good job? Is it a bad job? What should I do? Um, you know, and hopefully I can give them a little bit of insight, um, you know, in helping the decision to make. So if you want to, Tanner, if you're, you want to flip to that, that next slide. Sure, yeah. Uh, sure. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about my, my background, but just kind of wanted to frame this a little bit because I know there's a lot of coaches out there at various different levels, um, on the men's side, on the women's side, at the youth level. And I just, I wanted to kind of share that I've got experience at almost every level, um, you know, and on the men's side and the women's side. And, you know, hopefully I can, I can relate to, to everybody here. Um, you know, I'm going to try to make this something where people at different levels can take something from it. Um, you know, and, and if anybody has another thing, if anybody has questions, like I said, I'm not going to talk technical or, tactical a lot but if if anybody has questions at any point about anything that we do feel free to jump in you know i'll be happy to you know change topics and, and answer any questions that, that y'all have but you know like i said i'm a proud canadian and born and raised in st Catharines, ontario the niagara region and um you know you see up there first the cyo basketball thing in st Catharines, and, and first and foremost i'm, I'm just blessed um, tony house is on talking about his parents and you know i'm blessed to have just fantastic parents my mom and dad um, you know, they sacrificed a lot for me to follow my dreams. And um, when I was a kid growing up there, there, there wasn't a lot in way of youth basketball. And my mom and dad started St. Catherine's CYO basketball um, really out of our out of our house for nothing. And, and they did that for me so I could get a chance to play, um, you know, and, and I'm just very blessed. And my dad coached me at every level um, all the way from when I started playing when I was nine. And he was my high school coach um, all the way through. So. Um, they've done so much for me and I just thank them for what they've done. And, you know, they've instilled the, the values in me and, you know, faith in God and, and everything that drives me. So without them, you know, I wouldn't be where I'm at. So that, that's kind of where it starts. But I had a chance to be uh, an assistant for my dad for a year at Lakeshore Catholic High School in Port Coburn, Ontario. Uh, I was a GA at the NAI level, really good program. Um, and at Georgetown College, number three in the country when I was there. Uh, like you mentioned, being a grad assistant at the University of Kentucky was just uh, an unbelievable experience and going to an NCAA tournament. You know, from there, I was a, a men's division one assistant. Then I coached overseas and, and was an assistant at the professional level and uh, also coached the youth youth teams in the club, the, the U16 and U18 teams, and kind of was the uh, um, general manager of the youth program there. Um, was an assistant on the women's side at Coca College Division II. Um, worked for my wife there so that was a, a great experience and then came here to Mars Hill you know another D2 school as an assistant and now I'm the head coach so 
I've been on both sides, men and women. I've been, you know, every level from youth all the way to professional. So, um, you know, hopefully I can kind of relate what I'm doing to, uh, to everybody that's on here watching. Um, Tanner, if you can flip to that next one now. So, you know, I just finished my third full season as a head here and like, by no means are we done. You know, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but we really feel good with what we've done. You know, we feel like we've really put the time in. Um, we've been patient. We've built this thing the right way, done things the right way to where, you know, we're proud of what we've done. And we, we really feel like we've got it moving in the right direction. Um, so, you know, hopefully, like I said, there's a little bit of insight here, um, you know, for some people in, you know, what you can do when you're, you're faced with, with a challenge. So I'm a note taker and, and I know a lot of note takers out there love lists. So, I've got, I've got a list here. Um, you know, I've got the header, should I take a job? So again, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about, you know, that's a really bad job or you can't win there. Um, you know, and I don't think you can generalize like that. Um, you know, jobs come available for one of two reasons. You either, you know, the coaching staff have a lot of success and they moved up to a better job. Um, but the reality is most of us, um, you know, at least once in our career, we're going to have to take a job that, you know, the coaching staff got fired, um, you know, because they didn't do a great job because the team didn't have a lot of success. So, you know, it's, they can be deemed tough jobs, but does that mean we shouldn't take them? I think that there's a lot that goes into it. And, um, you know, we're all in different points in our career too. Um, you know, have, are we really driven, um, to be a head coach? Do we want to be a head coach at any cost? Um, or do we, are we okay with being an assistant? Um, you know, some of us, you know, what stage of your career are you in? You know, if you've been coaching for a long time and, and opportunities come up and, you know, maybe if you don't take it, you're not going to get another one. Um, you know, and some of us just can't be as choosy as others. You know, when we're, we're coming along, we got to nab the opportunity. It's tough to get a job. Um, you know, at the college level, and, and it's tough to get any, any coaching job. So sometimes we got to jump on it. Now, I've got a list here. I think the first thing you got to do when facing a, a challenge like this is just really self-assessment. Self All right, so are you built for this? And I've got some characteristics that I think are just super important when you're facing a, a challenge. So the first is being optimistic. Um, you know, you got to have great confidence in yourself and in your vision. I think you got to be positive. Um, everyone really has to feel, feel the hope and the vision that you have. Um, you know, and I said, I'm, I'm led by my faith. You know, one of my favorite verses is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And um, I wear it on my wrist, you know, every day. And, and, and I look at that and I always, I always think of the positive, you know, and I think when you're, when you're challenged like that, you always have to think positively. If you're somebody, a glass half empty person that, that, you know, looks at things negatively. I think a challenging situation like that is going to be tougher because there's going to be so many people telling you, you can't, um, you know, that sometimes I think that's going to get to you. So optimism is, I think is a huge thing. Um, I've also got resilient, be resilient, be patient, be committed. I think in those, in that order, they're really important. The resiliency is, um, you know, you're going to fail. You're going to have ideas that aren't going to work, aren't going to pan out. Um, you know, you're going to lose you're going to lose some games. You're going to, you know, you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. Can you, can you stay consistent, keep on your path? You know, can you, um, can you get not, not get down, not get frustrated? Be impatient. Same thing. I think quick fixes, quick fixes don't work. You know, um, you know, I'm guilty of this at the beginning of my career, like taking over a program that, that hadn't won um, in a long, long time being an optimist, I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to flip this thing overnight. You know, we're going to go from a team that's won, you know, four games the year before and, and we're going to win 20. And, um, you know, I've seen, especially at this level, coaches that recruit heavily on transfers, you know, if you depend heavily on transfers and, and you, you just look for, for talent and you jump at the best available players you can, sometimes that doesn't work out. Um, you know, have patience, understand it's a process, um, you know, don't skip steps and then be committed. Um, 
you've just got to, you got to be ready to work hard. You can't take the, I can't win here. Um, so why work hard approach? I've been, I've been at a number of schools now and I've had colleagues or I've seen people who, you know, you're in a tough job and you think, well, I can't win here. I don't have the resources. So I'm not going to put in the effort because what's the point? And I've seen that. And one, you, you're obviously, you're not going to win. You're setting yourself up for failure. Um, but you, you're doing your players an injustice as well. I mean, it's, it's their dream. They're here. Um, so whatever level you're at, um, you know, I think you just gotta, you gotta be optimistic. You gotta be resilient. You gotta be patient. You gotta be committed. You know, I think especially in, in, in challenging, um, tough jobs, I think those are super, super important. Um, you know, and just stay the course. Now, the number two, the first one's kind of more of a, you know, a look inside self-assessment. The next two are kind of assessments of the job. So you want to give yourself a fair chance. So do the expectations align with the support and the resources? Um, you know, again, I've been at different ends of the spectrum here. I've been at places that really don't provide a lot of resources in compared to other schools in the conference um, are near the bottom, but their expectations are to compete for championships and win. Um, you know, and I've been at other places where the expectations um, are really low and maybe they give you a little bit more resources. So I think you got to kind of look at that. You, again, you want to put yourself in a fair spot. And then the job security part of it, you know, more so at the college level because it's about winning here, but do the resources meet the, the expectations of winning too? If, you know, if you're given so much, are, you know, how much leeway are you going to have? Are, are you going to get fired for not winning in the first two or three years, um, you know, when you don't have the resources to do it? So I think, you know, just to be fair to yourself, I think you have to look at that stuff. Um, and then number three I got is the stepping stone, or can you be happy there if it's not? So depending on what you want to do with your career, um, you know, you want, you want to look at that, but you always got to be ready that, you know, it's not a stepping stone. Cause I've, again, I've been in some places where, you know, I've sat down and talked to other coaches that have been there for 30 years and they said, you know, I, I came in and, you know, I thought it was a stepping stone, but you know, now I've, I'm in my 25th year or something and they love it. So you just, you, you got to prepare for it not to be I think, you know, you got to look, is it a fit for your family? I'm, I'm married now and I have two little kids and, um, you know, it's got to be a good place for them. Um, geographical fit, close to family, that kind of thing. Is it an area that you want to live in? Um, you know, but you cannot look at the job as if it's a stepping stone. You know, when you're evaluating it, I think that that's one thing to look at. But you got to be in it. You got to be present. You know, and the saying is, you know, make the big time where you are. I, you know, I fully embrace that. I think you have to. If you, if you look ahead at the next job, um, you know, you're going to lose the one you're in. So I think that's, that's super, super key. Um, all right. I think, um, you know, self, the, the being self-aware, that first part is, is really, really crucial. Um, uh, you know, Billy Jean King said self-awareness is the most important aspect of becoming a champion. And, you know, I think a lot of people just don't have that self-awareness. I mean, you got to really know who you are. You got to understand your strengths. You got to understand your flaws and your shortcomings. And, you know, you can't lie to yourself. Um, you got to know what you're not good at. And, and you got to understand it, you know, like I had in the in number one, are you built for it? But I think don't let somebody else tell you you can't be successful somewhere, you know, or you can't win. You have to determine that yourself. And it's it's just true introspection i mean it's it's looking within you've got to know and have a feel if you know if you're built for that job and um you know and then and then look at the job like i said but um you know i just i just don't think anybody can can say you know hey that's a bad job or you can't win there you know and and i love i love a challenge you know and and that that optimism you know kind of comes through and um, you know, all those, those characteristics I've, I've kind of mentioned, but you know, it, I, I've not by any means been perfect in it. You know, it's, um, you know, it's been a process and, and I've hit bumps in the road. Um, uh, but like I said, I've, I put my heart into it. You know, I'm, I'm 
super passionate about what I do. I, I, I love my job, um, you know, and, and I think we've done it the right way and I'm, I'm proud of where we're going with this. All right. So um, if you do decide to take the job now, if, if you want to flip Tanner, flip to the next one. All right. Don't skip steps. Like I said, The quick fixes, you know, they're, they're just, they're not going to work. So I think this is one thing, and I'm guilty of this too, um, you know, skipping some steps in, in the process and, and just thinking I was going to be able to win right away. I think, um, you know, doing, doing this stuff that I'm going to talk about, it just gives you just a ton of insight into, into your program. Now, this can be the high school level, the youth level, um, the college level, the pro level identify what's been done there before. And I think like I jumped right into it. And now I, I was an assistant here first. Um, you know, I ended up getting the head job because things, things weren't going, things weren't going great. Um, you know, I got the interim job and I just thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and, and, and change things, you know, overnight. And I kind of learned along the way, um, you know, some of these things I'm talking about. And I, I'm going to, just before I skip on to that, I'm going to, I'm going to frame, I had a, a conversation. So I was the assistant, I was the assistant coach. Our head coach ended up getting fired. I took the interim job midway through, through the season. Um, we had a little bit of success. We did, we did okay. And, and administration liked the way, the direction we had the program going and, I had to sit down and talk with, with my athletic director who's, who's retired now, but you know, he offered me, he offered me the job full time. So we'd like to hire you on full time. Uh, you know, I'm real excited about it. I'm, I'm pumped. I want to be a head coach. Uh, you know, I love it here at Mars Hill and, and I'm fired up and ready to go. And, and he says to me, um, if I was you, I wouldn't take it. He said, I, I really advise you not to. Uh, he said, this is, this is the, the toughest job, the worst job in the Southeast region, if not in the entire country in division two. Um, and you, you could start out your career with two, you know, back to back 20 lost seasons and that could be the end of your career. Um, you could never bounce back. And, you know, I was kind of floored by that. And again, being the optimist, I, I just looked at him. So like, there's no way, you know, there's no way I'm, I'm passing this up. Um, you know, obviously I had to talk to my wife and, you know, we had to, we had to think things through, but like, there was never a thought in my mind that, you know, I can't, I can't do something here. So like, I just, I want to give a little bit of confidence to some people that, you know, if you believe in yourself and, um, you know, you do the right, the right things and, and do things the right way, you can be successful just about anywhere. So I don't think a lot of people identify, you know, what's been done in the past and what's been successful, what hasn't been su successful, why it's worked, why it hasn't worked. And, and I didn't do that at first either. And, you know, we hit some bumps in the road and um, I kind of thought like, let, let me really, it was about midway through my, my first season um, where I kind of, you know, said, let me, let me do, do a deep dive into this program because things aren't changing the way I thought they would. And, you know, look at culture, looked at the reputation on campus, looked at the connection, the community style of play. So, I mean, the culture, it was just no accountability. Um, really hadn't been, an emphasis had not been put into it. Um, you know, um, reputation on campus, again, coaches had so, get so caught up on the basketball side of it that, you know, effort wasn't put in to, you know, to – what we what we were besides basketball players weren't connected to the community you know and i think all, all this stuff is you got to sit down and talk to as many people as you can um you know this is at any level the high school level the college level pro level i mean sit down and find out what has happened what has been done you know sit down and talk to other coaches at, at, at your school and your program other coaches that, that coach against that program what have you heard what do you know what do you see um you know, and then you really got to evaluate and assess why it hasn't worked. I mean, do your homework, talk to your players. I mean, they, they're a valuable asset, but you just, you can't be afraid to ask anybody. You know, you can't be afraid to ask anybody. You can't be afraid, um, 
you know, to, to hear things that you don't want to hear, because I think that's the only way you're going to really understand um, where you're coming from and how to fix it. And like I said, it took me a little while to figure that out. But, you know, once once we did, I think, you know, that that really helped us get things turned around. So if you want to flip to the next one, I'm going to kind of get in, into, you know, what we did and, you know, why I think in, in some of that stuff has gotten jumbled a little bit, but again, for, for list takers. Now, I, I think this, this stuff, I mean, can really be key. And I had, um, I had a few things, I had some videos and a few things I wanted to share with y'all, but with my, with the laptop not working, I just have to go off of this. I'll kind of talk you through, um, you know, some, some different things that I was going to show you. So, some ideas about winning with less. All right, so a lot of us have been in this situation and I'm gonna talk about culture in here and, and just creative ideas and things that we've done that I think, you know, really can be implemented at any level. So the first thing really I got on here is don't settle. You know, again, that takes the optimism, the commitment, the patience, the resilience. You gotta have a find a way approach. Find a way no matter what, um, you know, it starts with cultivating relationships because I think, you know, everything is driven through your relationship with people um, and how you treat people, how you deal with people. So that's sitting down and having those conversations, like I said, asking them, you know, what's going on, but then never be afraid to ask for things from, for your program. All right. I, I've been guilty of this, you know, in the past of, you know, not wanting to reach out and ask people for favors too much. But if you, if you cultivate those relationships and show people you really care, um, you know, you can sit down and ask them for just about anything. Uh, you know, and I've learned that and that, that's helped my program out a lot. So, um, I think, uh, somebody was talking earlier, one of the podcasts mentioned early, earlier tonight mentioned Frank Martin, you know, something about, about tough love. So I I've taken a lot from him and I was going to show a little, little video. I had a little Frank Martin video I had, but I'll, I'll talk you guys through it a little bit. So, um, for us, the first thing I thought, you know, if we're, if we're going to build this program, it's going to be built on honesty, trust, respect, honesty. I want the guys to know where I stand with them, no matter what, you know, I want them to know what I think, what, what we think as a staff, I want to know what they're thinking. You know, I, I want us to be completely honest at all times, um, you know, even when it's tough, even when it's the tough conversations and, and tough things. And, and I want honesty throughout the whole program. You know, I want that to kind of, you know, just transcend, you know, the borders of the court, the classroom, the personal relationship, you know, what they do on campus in the community. Um, you know, and then I think if you're honest, you know, that builds trust. You know, if you've got honesty and trust, then you're going to have respect. And if you have honesty, trust, and respect, then I think you're going to have love. You know, and, and I'm going to talk about our core values and what we do with our culture in a few minutes here. But, I mean, we talk about love all the time. I mean, that's really what kind of we base everything around. So one of the greatest rewards for me, you know, one of the things I love the best is when I have a conversation with a player and, and – there's, it's rare that I have a conversation anymore and it doesn't end with, you know, and I love you, you know, I love you coach. And, and I love you, man. And I mean, that just, I think it, it kind of blew me away the first time it happened. And I just, that, that makes me feel great. Like I got into coaching, I talked about my dad a little bit and what he did. And I really got into coaching. I knew I wanted to coach at a young age because my dad always coached and I was around you know, as a kid, I was around him and his teams all the time. And the thing that, that stood out to me that, you know, kind of stuck in my mind the most was just the relationships he had with his players, the way they, they loved each other, the, the respect that they had, the way that, you know, they would still call him or come back and see him years later. And, and you know, they wanted to tell him about their lives. And, you know, I could just see the, the impact that he had. And, you know, I, that drove me, you know, and, um, you know, so just to just have that kind of relationship with the guys where we love each other and, you know, we, we're honest and, and we trust each other and we respect each other. And I mean, that, that's super special to me. I think if you have that, I mean, you can do really special things. And I was going to share the Frank Martin uh, 
video the clip and he's sitting down after a after a game and you know they ask him about tough love and he's known as a tough guy and um, he's tough on his players and they said you know coach how, how do you do this with, with tough love and he just says uh you know I hear that word a lot I hear tough love a lot and he said I, I don't know what that what that means I don't know what that is he said like if you love somebody you're going to be honest with them you know if you love somebody you're going to tell them the truth you're going to treat them the right way and uh he said if not that's just phoniness that's not love so he said I, I don't know what tough love is I just know what love is and you know that's that's what we try to you know what we try to preach what we try to be about is just just really truly loving each other and that means you know saying things sometimes we, we don't want to hear you know and I talk to the guys about who's who's toughest on you your, your parents right and they love you more than anybody so you know that's what you're going to get out of us um so I think, you know, that's what drives us. And then talking about the find a way approach and the cultivating relationships with people, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Now, one thing we faced here, we're in arguably, you know, and a lot of coaches will say we're in the best conference, uh, but we're arguably in the best division two conference in the country. You know, in any given year, we've got four or five teams in the top 25. Um, a couple of years ago, we had the number one and two teams in the nation, both in our conference. And, um, division two works a little bit different than division one scholarship wise not everybody's on the on the same page and um you know most teams in our league are fully funded which means 10 full scholarships and um, really good budgets and all that kind of stuff and you know when i first came as this, as an assistant we were at six scholarships so we were you know a little bit behind and you know when i took the head job administration decided uh they were going to cut all sports in half so we got cut down to three scholarships and you know so we're, we're dealing with a really uh, really stacked deck against us but i thought like I'm, I'm not again the optimism part i'm gonna find a way like what what can we do and you know this is something at the college level that that might not apply to other levels but i said you know how how am i gonna stretch these scholarships what can i do there's something i i, I can do so you know i built really good relationships with with administration but you know i was really really alert in in staff meetings and talking to other coaches and you know our president would sit in our meetings and and I could tell he would always talk about uh, you know money comes from it all comes from the same pot no matter if it's a scholar basketball scholarship money if it's academic money it all comes from the same pot so you know I started thinking of ideas well if if all the money comes from the same pot then it really doesn't matter um, if it comes from 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 me from basketball from the school so you know, I, I came up with a few, few different proposals of, you know, how can I control my money a little bit more? And, and I got them to, to allow us to use our basketball money, our, our total allotted money, academic scholarships, need-based money, and basketball money, you know, the way that we wanted to, instead of having to recruit a kid and, hey, let's see what their grades are, let's see how much need-based money they get, and then put a basketball scholarship on top of it. So what it, what it did was it allowed me to have a lot more control over the, the kids we were recruiting, um, allowed us to bring in a lot better players. And it wasn't affecting the, the bottom dollar for the, for the university. You know, so that's just one way. Um, you know, another, another thing was uh, when I came in, the previous two or three coaching staffs hadn't recruited the state of North Carolina. And, you know, North Carolina is known as a hoop state. There's a ton of basketball talent here. And, you know, I, I just, again, finding out why was it done? How come, you know, you know, how come it was done like that? And coaches were just afraid to, to compete in recruiting. You know, there's a, there's a ton of universities and colleges here in the state. And, you know, there's, there's really intense competitive recruiting. So they were going out of state, um, which we still have to do. But I, I wasn't going to get, you know, scared away from recruiting in-state kids and and you know that was a thing of we've got to find um, something to appeal to good players you know um, something of value and not settle and not just say we can't we can't get these kids so you know we, we really sold us you know we really sold our, our vision um, you know what that that whole love thing and, and and building men you know we want to win, of course, and, you know, and, and, and we talk about that in recruiting. We talk about um, getting a degree. You know, a lot of coaches will say, yeah, and, and parents, you know, the degree is the most important thing. Well, t 
to me, we want to win. We want to get a degree, but we want to build men, you know, and, and I want guys to leave Mars Hill and be better than they were when they came here. And guys can leave, um, you know, get a degree and still not have any idea, you know, what they want to do. Guys can leave your program and maybe be in the same place they would have been, you know, if they hadn't been there. So, you know, we, we try to help them with the, with the maturity, with the, with the confidence, with the skill set. Um, we talk about their, their vision for, you know, what they want to do for the rest of their life. And we, we build that from the time we start recruiting them. Um, and we keep building it throughout their time here so that when they leave, you know, they're, they're prepared to be successful in the world, you know, so we're, we're, we're selling that we're, we're completely invested in you as a, as a man. Um, and we're going to build you, you know, we're going to get you to a better place. Um, you know, and, and I tell, tell guys, like, if you come and commit to us, if you commit to me for four years, you know, we commit to you for the rest of our lives. So, um, you know, Tarek last night spoke about the Duke brotherhood and, and things like that. I mean, that's, that's what we're building here. And, you know, every senior that I've had has graduated. Um, they've all gone on it, get jobs that they really wanted. And I'm, I'm a huge advocate for, you know, do something you love. I'm, I'm so passionate about what I do and it just makes life better. You know, if you have a job that you love, you, you're not going to work um, any day. So, you know, we try to, we try to do that for our guys. Um, you got to find the hidden value. Like, can you flip something that was perceived as a weakness, um, you know, and turn it into a strength. So for us, it was the location. So, you know, we're in the mountains, we're in Western North Carolina in the mountains and in a really small town. And, you know, it's, Oh, how do you get kids there? And coaches, coaches will say, yeah, you don't want to go to the mountains. You don't want to go to Mars Hill. And there's nothing around there. We flip that. So we flip that to, um, you know, really use the beauty of our area. We embrace the mountains. You know, we embrace that. Um, you know, kids come here and they're a big fish in a small pond. You know, um, everybody here, you go to Walmart, you go to the grocery store, everybody, everybody knows who you are. You know, and, and it's a small town, but it's a, it's a college town. And everybody here is really, really hungry for, for success, you know, and they, they want a team to rally around. So it, it's special. You know, a lot of teams in our league are in the Charlotte area and bigger cities, and there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, and they can kind of get lost in the shuffle. So I, I feel like, you know, the spotlight is more on, on our guys here. Um, you know, and, and like I said, we make it the big time. Again, it's a, it's a, we're in the second poorest county in North Carolina. So, you know, a lot of poverty and stuff around here. But, again, we flip that. There's so much opportunity for guys to give back. There's so much opportunity to make impact in, in, in kids' lives and other people's lives that, that maybe other people don't have um, in other places. So, you know, we've, we've found some of that, that kind of hidden value, um, you know, and, and, and flipped it where people thought it was, um, you know, a negative. And if you can find things in your, in your club, in your organization, in your university where it's been painted with a, you know, with a negative stroke and people think it's, you know, it's, it's a weakness, um, you know, you can turn those into strengths and you can use that to your advantage. Now, differentiate, again, um, a lot of guys have come on here and talked about kind of marketing and branding. So, differentiate yourself um have a clear vision you know number one for me was have a clear vision and uh, you know obviously the vision for me i, I talked about it. It, it it transcends basketball but it's all about that that love and caring and the relationships and then on the court the vision of you know how i wanted to play really really instill a lot of confidence like we want our guys playing on both ends of the court with it with a ton of confidence you know we want to exude confidence we want to exude passion um, you know, we want to play, we want to play fast. We want to get up and down. We want to shoot the ball with a lot of confidence. We want to be exciting. We want to score a lot. Um, you know, and that, to me, that, that just from a vision from, from 10,000 feet, how, how we want to be perceived is important to start with. And then, um, your culture. So our culture, we've defined it as passion, purpose, pride. All right. It's something we got to live every day. And I wanted to pull this up. We, we've got, um, we've got def definitions of passion, purpose, pride, you know, that we've kind of came up with ourselves that relate to, you know, how we want to be as a program and, and kind of, you know, what we want to embody in everything we do. Um, and like I said, you've got to live it every single day. So 
our passion, our purpose, our pride are not just on the court. It's not just in the classroom. It's everything that we do. And I'm wearing a shirt right now. I want to show everybody, but I'm wearing a shirt right now. You know, we got passion, purpose, pride, you know, right across the chest. So, um, you know, we wear it, we live it. We try to keep it in our guys' heads every day. And, um, you know, we have stuff that we do, extracurricular stuff. And our passion, we talk about, is our, our community service off the court, our, our giving back, our getting involved with kids, our getting involved in the community with things. That's, that's, that's our passion aspect of, of what we do. It's, it's our, our love and, um, you know, treating others the way we want to be treated. Um, our purpose is our life skills stuff that we teach the guys. It might be as simple as learning how to cook to, to doing other simple things. And, and, you know, we try to, to, you know, get them outside their comfort zone and branch out and learn some things. And then our, our pride component is, you know, we just call it um, MHU pride. And as a team, we go and we watch every other team in every sport play at least once. We, we take them to the art gallery. We take them to music. We, we you know, we just want to support the university as a whole to really show pride in it. So our passion purpose pride isn't just something that we say. I don't think it's something you just, you know, put on a shirt or throw up in, on, you know, board in your locker room. I think it's something you got to live out every single day. So, you know, I think that winning with less, I mean, you got to know who you are. You got to really, really have a defined passion. Um, you know, we live it out, like I said, all the time. Three, we got our three P's in practice. So we've got, Passion plays, purpose plays, and pride plays. And, um, you know, I can, if anybody's curious on how we do all this, I can send it to anybody. But, you know, we, we define, you know, passion plays as things like, like hustle plays, like energy, that kind of thing. We've got, um, you know, purpose plays like communication, that kind of thing. Pride plays are like, you know, taking a charge. And, um, you know, we've got a whole list of them. So we chart those in practice, you know. And we have a, a Mr. Passion, Mr. Purpose, and Mr. Pride, um, you know, that we award every day. So there's, you know, we're looking at those things and trying to embody those and live those in everything we do. Uh, you know, in the games, we, we do something, um, you know, all of this stuff is still a work in progress. All this stuff's still evolving and developing. Um, but we came up with what we, we chart in games and we call them SGPs. So we have stop generating plays on the defensive end, score generating plays on the offensive end. And, you know, I had a chart I was going to show, but I'm going to just have to kind of talk this through. Um, so any kind of score generating plays, the hockey assist, the screen assist, you know, elite hit ahead passes, um, foul assist when, when someone gets fouled, doesn't score if it goes to the line and makes two, you know, things like that, things that, that generated a score they don't show up in the box score. You know, we just, um, you know, we want to reward that. Stop generating plays, things like deflections, taking a charge, um, you know, a good closeout contest, all, all, all these kind of things that we chart. And then the overall impact is what we call our other SGP success generating play. So it's going to be your, you're going to get a point for every stop generating play, a point for every six, uh, score generating play, and then your success generating plays are going to be all of those. So you're going to get a point for each of them. And the way we do it is we're going to divide it by minutes played by 40 minutes. So we're going to divide that by 40 minutes. So everybody is going to be on par with per minute that they played, you know, how many success generating plays did you make out there? You know, and that's, that's show, just showing your passion, your purpose and pride and, and what you're trying to do to help us win. It's not about, dropping 30 it's not about you having 10 assists it's you know are you making the plays that that are leading to success that are helping us so you know I think that that's kind of been something that that we've taken to and it's you know it's really kind of motivated guys to do things um you know you know unselfish things team things um you know, I talked about like the, the holistic approach that we, we take just it's, it's more than basketball. You know, it's it's just developing them as men. And again, taking off some Tark was talking about, um, you know, the branding thing. So, again, you got to do something that's going to stand out. So you can do this at any level, um, you know, brand yourself. So our colors are, are royal and, and, and gold, same colors as Gold State Warriors, you know, and we kind of looked at, you know, Steph Curry's a guy who's, you know, he's a good Christian guy and embodies a lot of the, the beliefs and, and characteristics and traits that we want our guys and our program to be known for. Uh, 
they also play with a lot of confidence. They have a lot of fun. You know, they're a brotherhood there too. Like when, when KD went there, um, you know, it was, it was everyone recruiting them and people would say, well, why would you go there? You know, they beat you and they knocked you out. And, and a lot of NBA players would kind of not have a lot of respect for that, for a guy jumping ship and going somewhere to a team that, you know, that knocked them out and beat them the year before. But it was like, he said, he was just drawn there. Like it's just a place that you, you want to go to because the guys just, like I said, it's a brotherhood and they're all in it for each other. And that's what we wanted, you know, and obviously they, they've been super successful and um, you know, we kind of, like I talked about embracing the mountains, embracing the hill. And, you know, we, we came up with an alternate logo and, and I, I, you know, got a, a shirt and some stuff I was going to show, but um, they've got the city logo. We came up with the hill logo and it, it looks just like theirs. It's got mountains in it. Um, you know, we came up with a, a cool gray color that we added as a, like an alternate color. Um, came up with it with a hashtag new hill. Um, in our passion, purpose, pride is on everything that we do. And, you know, people have loved the, the hill logo and the, and the, and the shirts and the gear that we have. I mean, I can't go anywhere on campus, you know, or on the road or something where people are like, man, that that's pretty cool. And where can I get one of those? And, you know, it's, it's just brought more attention. People know when we walk in the gym I and mean, we got bright gold on, we've got the hill logo, um, you know, and just something to catch people's attention. You know, in business, it's going to be called your value proposition. And, and what are you doing to bring value, um, you know, to the program and that, that people perceive as value that they want to be involved in. And it's really, um, you know, that's differentiated us. We're a little bit different the way we recruit. You know, my assistant, Alex Biggerstaff, has is, is done an awesome job. I mean, we, we came up with this when we first sat down and we we're getting in the program. Like, if we really want to build these relationships, we're going to recruit a much smaller pool of guys. We're going to pour in a ton more time and getting to know them, getting to know mom and dad, coaches, having them on campus multiple times, um, and just really showing them that, that we care about them and we want to build that relationship. And, um, you know, we do a thing where when we offer a scholarship, it, you know, it take, it's a process. It takes us a long time and we don't offer until we're hundred percent sure that that guy's a fit and we can coach him. And we also don't offer until we feel like um, that guy has a lot of interest in us. You know, I, I feel like it's, you know, we want our, our, our offers to mean a lot to be really, really meaningful. And we have never pulled an offer. So we don't, we don't put a timeline on guys. We don't, we don't pressure. We don't say, I need to know in two weeks. I need to know by this date. Um, we really, really do our homework and put our time in and get to know guys. And um, when we do offer the offers, the offers there, you know, and sometimes it, it takes longer. And if we lose guys, it's going to hurt because we, we put a lot of time into it, but we feel like we're doing it the right, the right way. And we've gotten, uh, we've had a lot of success doing it that way. You know, we've gotten some guys that, um, you know, have had plenty of higher level division one offers and that kind of thing that we feel like we've won here just because of our relationships. Um, be creative with your resources. This is a super important one too. Like at first we felt like, you know, maybe we can't recruit the talent that some other programs are because they have the, they have the pedigree. They, they might have the resources. They might have, um, the championships and all that kind of stuff. So, um, some guys, they were recruiting guys that were a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. So we kind of took like, a, you know, Canadian university and youth sport, they get five years to play. And, and, um, coaches were on earlier talking about it's usually teams with the fourth year and the fifth year players that win. So we said, you know, how can, how can we get bigger, stronger players? Well, we, we decided to, uh, redshirt a lot of our freshmen, the freshmen that come in. And so we've had, you know, five year players in our, you know, our two leaders this year were fifth year seniors. Um, you know, our guys are more experienced. We get a year to, to work with them, develop them, get them bigger and stronger, um, get to know them better, build that relationship, get them to really understand what the passion, purpose, pride means and uh, what they need to do to be a Mars Hill Lion. And, you know, it's really helped. And I think it's, you know, again, that's helped in recruiting too, because it's set the groundwork. We've, we've got guys sitting out that are going to play the next year that have experience in practice and we know what we're getting. There's less pressure on recruiting. Um, so I think, you know, being creative, building, giving us an extra year by red shirt and players has helped. I mean, we've had to be gritty and do the dirty work. I mean, we've had to renovate locker rooms ourselves. Um, 
cook meals for our guys ourselves, you know, do things like that, go to the grocery store and, and be more creative with our money, more, more resourceful with our money to where the guys could eat. Um, we get steak and things like that. And, and maybe they have to cook, maybe we have to cook for them, but they can eat a little bit better during the Christmas break here. We've got about a month where our dining halls closed and you know, we got to find ways to feed guys um, down to, you know, little things like on senior day, guys love to get their Jersey and we go places and people are getting really fancy framed jerseys. And right now we just don't have the budget for it. So um, going out and buying jerseys ourselves and framing them ourselves or buying the frames and framing them ourselves, just doing things like that, um, you know, to put the work in. But I mean, those are just some little things that we've done. Um, you know, we feel, like I said, we feel good about what we've done and where we are. We still have a lot of work to do, but it, it's all been generated around, around the relationships and the caring and getting to know each other and being, being honest and being genuine and, um, you know, I don't think there's any shortcuts to that. I don't think there's, there's any secrets for a quick fix or, you know, a, a secret to winning. I think if you want to win over the long haul, build longevity in your program at any level, um, you know, it, it comes down to those things. So um, I don't know if anybody has questions about anything, Tanner. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, it's just taking myself off mute. Uh, I'm just gonna, Coach. I'm just gonna put your uh, contact info up here as well, uh, because we've got people asking for that. There we go. Absolutely, and I, I did something that most people aren't gonna do, but I, my email's up there, my Twitter's up there, and and I, my personal cell phone's right up there. So I love talking hoops, you know, and I'll answer any questions. I'll I'll talk anytime, you know. I've I've been away from from Canada for a long time, and I'm not connected you know, like I would like to be with a lot of Canadian coaches. So, I mean, I would love to get to, to meet new people and talk, you know, reach out to me, shoot me a text and, you know, tell me who you are and, um, you know, or send me an email or, or DM me, but, you know, I'll answer any questions and, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll talk hoops anytime. Sure. Coach, we'll fire you a couple of questions. And if, uh, if you got the time. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. Uh, so first one for you, uh, when taking over, say, a high school program where you cannot necessarily recruit athletes, how do you grow a program? What are some of the first steps that you would take? Well, again, evaluate. Evaluate what you have. So instead of kind of just looking and saying, you know, I, you know, we can't win and I don't have talent here, you got to look at what you have. You, you're going to have um, some strengths. You know, there's going to be some strengths there that you can use, um, you know, to your benefit. You, you've got to, you got to put a system in that's going to, you know, it might not be, you got to be flexible. It might not be the system that you want to play. I've, I've had to play a lot of different styles and systems. You, you've got to look at the strengths of your players. You've got to figure out a system that's going to be the most successful, um, you know, for what you have. But I'm, I'm just a really, really strong believer in, if you, if you build that relationship with the players, you, you really genuinely put that time in with them, um, you know, and you care and you get them to run through a wall for you, you, you can be a lot more successful with, with, with less talent. So I think that all plays in, but, you know, get them to buy in and, and get them to know you care about them. And, and, you know, I think you can beat some teams with more talent if your guys will play harder for you. Thanks. Next one. Um, is it uh, near impossible to win uh, or should I say have successful seasons in the win and loss column with those scholarship players? What is the real difference given all the intangibles that you've spoken about? Well, you know, I did talk about how I got our scholarship money up a little bit, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously you need players and, and we play at a really high level. Um, so we, we need players. So part of it was find a way to, you know, find a way to get more. I mean, I just don't think you ever take no for an answer. You can, if, if you bring another one, you know, I just talked about is bring value to your institution. So we've recruited more players. We've recruited more kids than we've been asked to do. We've, we've brought in more and um, recruited student managers. And we've, we've done things that have gotten, you know, the school, a lot of media attention, social media news has come in, um, things like that. If, if you bring value to the institution, um, you know, you, you, you can ask for more. So the scholarship part of it has been, you know, has been a big part of us getting better. I think be really wise with your resources. If you have very small amount of scholarship money, like 
you need one or two key players and good players recruit other good players. So if you've got a good player, they will help you get another one. Now, if you don't have any, any quality players, it's hard to recruit. That first one is really, really tough. And our first really, really high level player just um, graduated was the first team all conference uh, is going to be a pro next year. And I had some clips that I was going to show too. He hit, two games in a matter of a week hit buzzer beater game game winners for us. And, um, you know, good players are attracted to other good players. So if you have minimal scholarships, you, you got to make sure you get that one marquee guy, but to get that guy, it's tough. And, and you've got to create some kind of value. You've got to sell them something that other people can't. Um, so you've got to decide, you know, what that is, but I think you, you got to get that first one. Um, the other intangible stuff. I mean, I, I can't harp on it enough, but like, get them to buy into your vision and, and you can't trick them into buying into it. One, you gotta, you gotta talk to them. You gotta be willing to ask the players and, and, you know, our passion, purpose, pride, we re rework this all the time. And we're, you know, we, we are in a process right now where each guy right now is, is got an assignment where they're evaluating. What does that mean for them? You know, and they're sending me that and we kind of, we're building that out together. And um, our, our team, we don't do team rules, but team standards, um, they're going to build that out. They're going to build out what are our standards, what are our expectations. And I think that's a lot more powerful because, you know, our leaders are going to drive that. Our players have come up with the expectations. Um, so instead of me just harping out there, you know, they're going to keep each other accountable for it. Mm -hmm. Long-winded answer, man. I told you I could talk. <laughs> that was good, man. Hit, hit right on. Uh, last one for you then. Um, do you try to hire or link up with people uh, to build relationships within the community? Uh, or, or, or are you, as the head coach, the centerpiece of making those things happen? So, in other words, uh, who is planning the team volunteer opportunities, social media, team promotion, et cetera, those, those type of things? So – we have uh, we have a sports information director that does some of our social media stuff. I've I've got an assistant that is really good at social media stuff, and he runs our social media accounts. And I've got our our team Twitter on there and our website too, if people want to check that out. But as far as our community service stuff, I mean that that's me. Um, you know, I want to be in the forefront of showing people that I'm. You know, I care about the community. I care about them. I'm. You know, I'm involved. I got kids in school, kids in youth programs. I, you know, I'm I'm around in the community, and you know, we we do stuff at the school. We do stuff at at our local churches, um, food banks, that kind of thing. And um, that has really, I'll tell you what, that that's grown our support in the community. People coming to games, um, you know, just being excited about us, and um, it's it's been really powerful. 